Good morning. Welcome to Urban Voice Gordon's Bay. I'm so glad you joined us for the fourth sermon in the series called Soil. My name is Wesley and this morning we're also gathering in one place. And I just want to invite you, if you're living close to the um, Helderberg area or even in the Cape Town region, you want to come and visit us one Sunday when we're having one place. It would be great to have you with us. Just let me know and I'll make sure that you're on the registration for attending the meeting. We're busy with the series and we're looking at the parable of the sower and the seed and the soil. We're examining what this parable means and what, how it impacts on our lives. We looked at three um, of the so two of the soils so far. We've looked at the path, which is the ground where the birds just come and they take away the seed um, and eat it up. It doesn't get a chance to even take root. Then we looked at the rocky ground, which is like shallow and just below the surface, it's rocky and the soil uh, is not conducive for the, for the little seed to sprout out. It takes root, but then shrivels up as the sun comes and beats on it. And then today we're looking at the weeds, the area of ground which is overgrown by weeds and the weeds um, come and what the weeds actually mean in our lives. Now, Jesus uses parables, he uses these word images um, like God, the kingdom of God is like a seed or God is like a father welcoming home a wayward son, if you think of the prodigal son. And he, he uses that to teach us deep truths about how we can get to know him, but also that we can examine ourselves. In this parable, we ask to examine our hearts, actually. Are there characters, character traits? maybe even beliefs, defects that you have, that you, you don't actually allow God's word to take root in your life. And therefore you don't produce good fruit. The aim is always to produce good fruit. fruit. Now, if, if people talk about this as the parable of the sower, I want to suggest to you that it's more about the parable of our hearts. And how's your heart? The Bible is clear in Jeremiah 17 verse 9. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In our hearts. That's why we need a heart transform. That's why God wants to come and work in our hearts. And we're going to examine our heart today. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to do that well. Thank you, Lord, that we again today can allow you to come and operate on our hearts. Yes, Lord, show us those character traits in our lives that needs to change. Those things that are not honoring to you. Those attitudes that we need to change. Those beliefs that we have when we realize actually it's not right. It's not in line with your word. So come and help us to examine our hearts. But we pray that through this, our hearts will be prepared to, to receive the seed and to produce fruit. In Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Over the last couple of weeks, I've looked at the whole aspect of hearing. Because Jesus says, he who has ears needs to listen and understand. In verse 13, when they ask him, why does he speak in parables? He says this, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And Jesus said, they are they hear, they can hear the sound, but they're not listening. They're not paying attention. They, they, they can't understand what is being said. It almost reminds me of, uh, I was recently in Tanzania and, and I could hear them speaking to me, but I didn't understand the language. Swahili, I didn't understand it. And then I tried to get to understand a few of the words. But, you know, when they spoke to me, I didn't understand the word and therefore... I couldn't respond to it. I needed an interpreter. John Wesley, he looks at this thing and he, he says, The same sower Christ and the same preachers sent by him always sow the same seed. Why has it not always the same effect? Why? The problem is, and one of the problems I want to just bring out today is, it's actually sometimes people hear what they want to hear. This selective hearing. 
They want to hear things that make them feel good. Or they want to hear things so whatever they hear must agree already with what they think. In 2 Timothy 3 verse uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, it says, For time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Verse 4, they will reject the truth and chase after myths. The NIV talks about they want to listen to things that suit their own desires. And we see lots of that kind of preaching happening around in our world today. We're having false prophets in Africa. We see a huge amount of that happening with people following men who say they are prophets and call themselves apostles and all sorts of things. But they're not teaching the truth. They're teaching things that people want to hear. And so they get a, a great following. But we also live in a world that is consumer minded. So whatever feeds my consumer passions, what I want to consume, that's what I go after. I like what Eugene Peterson, the writer who wrote the message, he also spoke about that the food that they get is like spiritual junk food. You know, that McDonald's meal, they're looking for something instant, something that's processed even, not something that they actually need to cut and chew. They're looking for catchy opinions that just tickle their fancy. And they get excited about this preacher because he's saying everything that they want to hear. The Amplified says this, it will not, they will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. And so they seek preachers who support the errors that they hold. So I want you just to think about that for yourself. If you're a Christian following today, who are you seeking after? Are you seeking after God or are you seeking after things that your itching ears would want to hear? And so they turn away from good teaching. They turn their backs on that. I pray you wouldn't do that today. My desire as a, as a preacher is to make sure that I'm teaching accurately the Word of God. That you can go and check up after I've preached and see, is this scriptural? Is this in the Bible? You have the full right to do that. You should be doing that, in fact. Again, I just say, if you don't understand the scripture, and if you haven't spent some time schooling yourself in the scriptures, you're not going to actually even be able to discern if you're hearing truth or not. We had a situation just recently where someone said some things in a small group, a guest or visitor that was coming along, and, and quickly two people picked up, hey, that's, that's not, not uh, accurate with scripture. This is some other mystical idea that has been brought in. But you see, those two people understood the scriptures and they've been going into the scriptures and studying it for themselves. And talking about preaching, let's look at the sower. The preacher of the gospel is a servant of the sower. We are co-sowers with Jesus. In preaching, we point people to Christ we, and we proclaim what Jesus taught. Point people to Jesus and proclaim what Jesus taught. And we also remind you of God's amazing promises. But in our preaching, and as Paul wrote in his letters, which was basically almost like preaching, he also warned, and Jesus also warned, people of behavior that doesn't honor God, or, or Christians, unchristlike behavior, unchristlike attitudes. But as a preacher, it's wonderful when we see our preaching and our teaching produces changed hearts, transformed hearts. But that is not our solely up to us. It's not how, how wonderful an orator we are, and how great we can actually uh, set out a sermon. Paul um, was always compared with another preacher of his time called Apollos. And Apollos was a wonderful preacher, and Paul said so. He's a great preacher and people were getting more excited about Apollos than 
and Paul. And Paul said, hey, it's so long as the word of God is being preached. Paul was not a great orator. And he says, I'm not a great orator. So it's not to do with that. There are two things. Two things. Number one, how effective this becomes into your life is number one, the work of the Holy Spirit. The preacher is useless without the Holy Spirit. Whatever I say is useless. It will be air, it will be pie in the sky, unless the Holy Spirit works in your heart. Secondly, it's got to do with the receptiveness of your heart. The sower sows the seed. We can prompt an individual to reflect upon their lives. But repentance and transformation comes through their own confession. That they need to change. Jesus, I need your help. It's the same with an alcoholic who needs to admit that they're an alcoholic first. Before change can start. And so the Holy Spirit is always involved. The preacher is not the Holy Spirit. The emphasis is on the personal responsibility of individuals to respond rightly to the gospel. I normally tell people I am rubbish at making what is known in the evangelical world as altar calls or appeals. And can I say that Jesus never did that, by the way? Just by the way, it's, it's more of an evangelical trend. Jesus just said to people, follow me. Follow me. And it's in the following that they became more like Christ. So I'm not really good at that. Because I actually kind of believe this whole thing of saying, you know, you've heard the word, you need to respond. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Make a decision about how you're going to respond. Are you going to surrender or not? I'm very kind of matter of fact. I don't like fishing and, you know. So you'll notice that that's not my style. Because I don't think it's all about me. It's about the Holy Spirit and your response. Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this. He understands, talking about the preacher, that he is not responsible for the harvest. He is only responsible for the care and the industry with which he scatters the seed. He does not make his seed. The seed is given him by his master. And so when I preach, it is comforting to know that I'm not responsible for the soil. I'm only responsible for spreading and scattering the seed as wide as possible. So what about the seed that is given to us? As a preacher, even as Christians who share the gospel, they may not, we may not call yourself a preacher, but you, have a, you know the gospel, you, you're called to share the gospel, you're called to tell people about Christ. We carry the most amazing an important message that this world will ever hear. Remember, seeds don't grow in a packet. You've got to open the packet up and you've got to spread the seed. It's got to be thrown out, thrown out. And when we see a barren field, and I've seen it often just driving, um, you know, on the N2 National Road, and you see these um, fields and they they've been told and there's nothing on it and it just looks like fields and then you come back a few months later and there you see there's green shoots as they've either planted wheat or they've planted canola seeds or something has been planted there and this barren field all of a sudden is green there's life in it and that's how the gospel comes and transforms our life a barren life and when the gospel comes in it changes us says it flourishes it can it can turn a dead dry life into a fruitful life that glorifies God the seed the word of God is powerful Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 he says for I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. The message of the gospel has tremendous power. And if you read the scriptures, especially as you read the New Testament, 
We see that anyone who encounters Jesus, anyone who hears the gospel of Jesus, will be changed forever. We see it in Matthew, the tax collector, and his other friend, Zacchaeus, who was also a tax collector. We see it in Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. But for us, I want to say, we also experience it. As Christ comes and changes our lives, as we have encounters with Him. But it's not just only that moment when we encounter Him, because we then start to live a life with Jesus. It's not about only saving faith, it's also about living by that faith. And so the gospel is active in our Christian life. And so we come to the third soil. Let's go to verse 7. It says, Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Verse 22, where Jesus gives the explanation, it says, The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the word, but are all too quickly the message is crowded out. Look at that word, crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The thorns are weeds. And this soil is overgrown by weeds. So the seed falls and actually it, it, it takes root, but there's a, there's a fight. There's a fight between the seeds and the weeds. And so the weeds tend to overpower this plant and destroys it. And, and Jesus is saying, watch that there are the weeds in your life that will come and try to overpower you. They fight for the ground. <laughs> they fight for the nutrients and the nourishment. And so the weeds come and they choke the plant. When you think of the word choke, you know, it's to choke the life, the breath out of you. Chokes you. Cut off your air supply. And when your life is overrun by spiritual weeds, you cannot experience the life of God. It chokes out the spiritual life in you. You can't breathe spiritually. And I like what it says there. It describes that the message is crowded out. In other words, you have a crowded heart. A crowded heart. So let's look at three weeds that choke the word. And I'm going to use the Mark version of the same parable. Mark in Mark chapter 4 verse 19, as he writes, he says, But all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, and so no fruit is produced. First of all, the worries of life. This is the person who says, you know, I trust the Lord, but then worries about the things of this world. My life is so busy. Oh man, I've got my family, my children and the sport. I'm like the, the taxi driver for my family, you know. There's dance classes and, and then I'm helping them with homework and then I've got my job. And the fathers are saying, man, you know, all the things that I select to do and maintain the house and you know, I've got to help some other people. And then you've got your family members and your aging parents and a whole range of things that you need to take care of. And often, because of your busyness, the urgent is placed above the important. And so you say, you know, oh, yeah, I'm so busy. I don't have time to read the word properly. To be involved in discipleship relationships. To be available to serve. To have coffee with a new believer or to pray. And your busyness with the things of this world, there's a distraction. Bill Hybels, he puts, he writes a book and he wrote this book and it's called Too Busy Not to Pray. And so many of us just do the bare minimum. Just in case the preacher or Wesley is going to say something about this. And then you say, hey, I'll do my bit. But it's more to appease yourself than to really please God. 
So the worries of this life, is that choking you today? If you evaluate your life, you look at your life, you think, wow, where is my time going? What is the urgent in my life? Is that more important than my relationship with God? Secondly, the lure of wealth. The NIV says the deceitfulness of wealth. The love of money is a problem in our world. I'm going to say it again. The love of money is a problem in our world. But the lack of money is also a problem in our world. I'm sure we all would say, I wish I could do with some more money. So during lockdown, here's an interesting fact. The world's richest 10 men double their fortunes to 1.5 trillion US dollars during the pandemic. And that comes from Oxfam, which is an organization that, that works among the poor, actually. Wow, that's staggering. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The desire for wealth, Jesus is saying here, is the problem. And we spurred on by the greed of capitalism. We live above our means. We even get into debt because we try to keep up appearances. If you look at your own financial state, what are the things that you need to maybe cut the cloth so that it can fit your budget and fit your wallet? How materialistic have we become? Where we value things above people and above God. And Jesus knows all about that. That's why he spoke more about money than he actually... The only thing that he spoke more about money was the kingdom of God. The second thing is money. You see, God sees your hearts. And you even may be following Jesus. But you're really struggling financially. You're struggling to make ends meet. But you're faithfully following Jesus. But you have a friend who totally rejects Jesus and they're making loads of money. And so you have to watch your heart. Because now jealousy and envy creeps in. And your contentment in God is rattled. Can I just say, you spoke about worry, rich people worry. Who has the most sophisticated alarm systems, rich people, to protect their stuff? This stuff is more important. The security of their stuff, let's put it that way, is more important than their own spiritual security. And so we need to be careful that we need to make sure that our devotion to wealth or making money doesn't stop our supreme devotion to God. As Christ followers, money is not our chief security. It's not the primary source of our security. Jesus is. And when Jesus is talking here, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And the lure of wealth and, and materialism, that's all part of the kingdom of this world. How is your attaining and looking and trying to achieve more wealth choking and stunting your spiritual growth? Are you a good steward of what God has given you? Is the money that you're getting, are you being gener generous with it for advancing of the gospel? How's your tithing and your giving? How's your helping of the poor? Or Every spare cent that you have, is it all about your own relaxation, passions, comfort, that you can spend it on yourself? The third thing that Jesus says is the desire of other things. In Luke, it talks about the pleasures of this world. What passionate desires do you have that's competing with your desire for Jesus? What 
other desires are having first place above your desire for Jesus. Can I say, just look at where you spent most of your time this week. Maybe you binged, watched a series, 10 episodes, 45 minutes. That's a lot of time. Instead of praying or devoting yourself to studying the scriptures or reading a good Christian book, what about how, many, how much time you spent reading Facebook articles or scrolling your Instagram instead of studying God's Word? How much time have you spent in sport and recreation rather than in fellowship with other Christians, in discipleship, in work and serving in a ministry? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33. And can I just say, God will not share His supreme position with anything or anyone else. Not your spouse, not your children, not your house, not your job, not your recreation, not your possessions, not your social media, and not yourself. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So how do we apply this? How do we bring this all to practical outworking within our life? Mark 4.19 says that this chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. It doesn't bear any fruit. You see, the seed of the gospel cannot survive to produce fruit in a heart that is filled with other things. Those thorns that hinder us and prevent us from being fruitful for the glory of God. There's no fruit to be seen in this life, in the life of the Christ follower. Have you allowed your heart to be filled with other desires? Overcrowded. Can I just remind you again, God knows the intentions of your heart. He knows exactly where he fits into your life right now. And it's time that you're honest to be able to admit where he fits in. If he's not number one, won't you do that today and say, Lord, won't you be number one in my, my life? God knows if you're genuine or not. God knows if you surrendered or not. He also knows if you're hurting. He also knows if there's pain. But he also knows if our heart is divided part-time Christian, part-time following Jesus, because the other desires take up the other time. And can I say, because these thorns are not removed, it's going to choke and prevent you from being fruitful. My desire, as I preach this word, is that you would be fruitful. We would see, you would see the fruit of Christ active in your life. The transformed life, the fruit of the Spirit, evident in the way that you live your life. And so can I urge you today, separate yourself from those weeds. Ask God to come and do the weeding in your life. Make some clear decisions about how you're going to spend your time. Look at the areas of worry in your life. Look at the areas of money and wealth in your life. Look at the areas of other passions and other desires. Do an honest inventory. Allow God to do the reading. So confess, repent, and make your life open. Say, yeah, my Lord, take out these weeds. Take out these thorns. I want to be fruitful. Let's pray together. Father, I want to say thank you once again that you speak to our hearts. Thank you that we can hear this morning and I pray that we would listen, not put our fingers in our ears, but we pray God come and do your weeding in our lives. Some of us have been Christians for a while and we're not as fruitful as what we could be. Help us as we look at our lives, examine our lives, let us be honest with you and say, Lord, come and cleanse my heart from those other passions. Maybe you've never ever committed your life to Jesus. 
And this morning, as you're listening, you like that seed, you, you're trying to listen, but there's so many things in your life, and you're just saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to even grow. You say, Lord, here I am. Your seed is starting to grow in my life. But there's so many other things that's wanting to choke it. Come and do the weeding so that I can be fruitful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this morning. And I do pray that this word has really encouraged you. Go and meditate on that. I do send out every week a reflection question. So if you're interested in getting that, maybe you got this from a friend, send me an email, wesley at urbanvoice.org.za. And uh, through the week, you can meditate on this word further. If you've decided this morning to surrender your life to Christ, please contact me as well. I'd love to help you to grow in your faith. Next week, we'll be doing the final sermon in the series, and we'll be looking at the fertile soil. So join us next week at 9.30. God bless you and have a fantastic day further.